Good morning. Happy Christmas Eve day. Yes, we're excited. We're glad you're here. If you're a guest with us, we're glad you've, can, you've, you've arrived here. And if you're a guest online, we're glad that you're here as well with us uh, via intronet. But uh, anyway, before we get started in today's message, I want to honor someone who's just graduated from Johnson University. So Caleb McClymonds, would you come on up here, buddy? So... Caleb grew up at Camp Pitt, but he also grew up in this church. And Caleb, tell us a little bit about, uh, about where you're headed. Yeah, so um, in the next few weeks, I'll be applying for residency programs. i um, looking for like adult ministry or um, still looking at worship um, as a, a future uh, a profession. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, Caleb, we are, uh, we're proud of you, buddy. It's not easy. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we're real excited that you're headed into ministry. Yep. And if the world needs anything, it needs people to explain the gospel to people. So, man, can we give it up for Caleb? Thank you, man. I warned him right before the song I was going to ask him to do that. And he says, sure. And I was like, that's the kind of courageous spirit that you need. And that's what we're talking about, courage today. Last week, we talked about God using Mary in the birth of Jesus. And she had to make room. In the greatest limits of her life. She was a virgin. She wasn't married. But she's going to have a baby. The Christ child. This week we're going to talk about making room for the courage to do God's will. If we're going to follow God. If we're going to do what he calls us to do. If we're going to take on the challenges there is in following Jesus. Then we're going to need courage. We're going to need God-sized courage. And if I could, if I could add one candle. I don't know if the camera can follow me for those on the internet. But... If I could add one candle, this, this is the Advent candle. You see this, y'all? Yeah, this is, the, this is called the Advent thing. If I could add one candle, it would be, it would be this candle right here. And you can imagine what, what this candle is labeled. This is the courage candle. All right? So I've just, I've just messed up some ancient old tradition by adding the courage candle, but that's okay. We can, add, we can have a new tradition. We can add courage to the Advent candle because the people in the story of the birth of Jesus had to have great courage. And Joseph is a man of courage. And we're going to be looking at him, at him today. You know, our world is full of fear. If you turn on the news, they want you to be scared of everything. I saw this past week that there's, there's like a fryer that's blowing up. And so you might have this fryer on your countertop and you don't want it to blow up. That'd mess up your uh, holiday gathering, wouldn't it? You know, right? I mean, there's fear, fear, fear coming out of the, out of, uh, out of the media. And, and our world seems to be terrified. And a scared world needs a fearless church. And we need to have courage. When, when God told Joshua in the Old Testament, said, Joshua, I want you to go into Canaan land, he was taking on demonic giants. I mean, he had every reason to be afraid. But God tells him, this is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. He needed courage. And the Lord told him, be courageous. I am with you. Some fears are more easily overcome than others. If you're scared of the dark, you have a nightlight. One of my greatest fears is cauliflower. How do I overcome that? You pour lots of cheese on top of cauliflower, a big old cheese gravy pot right on top of it, right? And you can eat anything when you pour enough cheese on it, right? So <laughs> I looked up, I looked up what, some, what some of the fears are of Christians. And here's a list of a few of them. Fearing of sharing your faith. Fearing of sharing your faith with your family members who are not saved. Fear of sharing your testimony in front of others. Everybody gets, gets, likes to get up and... Talk in front of a big group of people, right? Fear of acknowledging that you're a Christian among non-Christians. Fear of standing for moral values. Fear of admitting that you believe in the stories of the Bible, like Noah's flood, like uh, the resurrection of Jesus, the virgin birth. Fear of teaching a new believer. Fear of ministering to someone in great need, someone in great poverty. You don't feel capable. You don't feel quite adequate to meet their needs. Fear of going into ministry. Obviously, Caleb is not. He's courageous, right? Fear of meeting new people. Here's one. Fear of serving in children's ministry. All those terrifying little people back there will eat me. You know, uh, 
Joseph, Jesus' stepfather, is a great example of, cur- of, of courage that overcame, you know, just, just an, who, could, who could imagine for Christ's child coming through a virgin and him being the stepfather? And so the first thing we need to see in Joseph's story is he needed courage to endure the animosity of the world. Now, by world, let me define that. I mean, his world was his family. So his family is not going to be for this. He, his world is made up of the town that he lives in, in Nazareth. His, the town's people that he knows, his friends and neighbors, are not going to understand this. And then, besides of all of that, he's living under the oppression of Rome. And they're going to govern his life, and it's not going to be easy. Other than Jesus facing the cross, I think there's no greater example of a man with courage than Joseph, the stepfather of Jesus. Let's begin reading in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph, but before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. In those days, marriages were arranged. There was a betrothal agreement that took place before the marriage ceremony. So the parents of the bride would give the husband to be a dowry so he could begin to build uh, the, the place where they would live, normally a house attached to the in-laws. Don't you all love that idea, right? Like So just another room, right, attached to the parents' place. Uh, and and so, so there was money exchange. He himself had to uh, provide a, a certain... Uh, uh, amount of money in the case of his death that Mary would be cared for uh, in, in the event of her death, at least for a short time. But, but these marriages were arranged. Now, that's not such a bad idea, is it? Parents arranging the marriages of their children? <laughs> I knew there'd be some dad out there. I knew there'd be some dad out there, some granddad out there that would say that. When I went to India, I picked up a, a local newspaper from uh, New Delhi their capital, and I brought it back and I showed our youth group uh, the classified section, which was just full of parents trying to find a spouse for their child. And they listed all the attributes of their child and then they were, what their child would need in a person. Now, now, you might think that's crazy. You might think that's weird. But you know what? It's, it's not a bad idea if you're thinking about getting married, about asking your parents or a parental figure, hey, what do you think? about this person you know if you follow your heart like hollywood says you're going to be in trouble because jeremiah talks about the heart that it's the most deceitful thing that we deal with in life is our own heart so uh anyway joseph and mary they're they're betrothed they're engaged they're not sexually intimate they're not living together but they're in this they're in between time they're essentially married in the eyes of the community except for that part and so um so anyway uh in Luke, if we take Luke's account of what took place uh, after uh, in Matthew's story, after this verse, here's what we know. Mary is visited by an angel, and they have a conversation, and she finds out she's going to be carrying the Christ child, and it will come about by the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit. So after that conversation with the angel, in just a, few, just a little short time, maybe a couple days, the, the Holy Spirit comes, and, and she's impregnated with a Christ child, and then she immediately goes to her uh, uh, fam, or distant family member, Elizabeth, and spends six months living with her. She's pregnant with John the Baptist and, and very far along. And so, so Joseph doesn't see Mary after her conversation with an angel. Uh, a matter of fact, in those betrothal arrangements, sometimes, sometimes the... Uh, the two people getting married didn't see each other until the day of the wedding. <laughs> what a surprise. Anyway, uh, so, so anyway, she goes off. And when she returns, you see, he hasn't seen her for six months. And she's showing. And it hit him like a ton of bricks. He doesn't believe in what she has told him. And neither would we. We wouldn't believe it either. And so Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man. He did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. Only by legal decree could the engagement be broken. And she coming back pregnant in the Old Testament law, there is the allowance of stoning her to death for her unfaithfulness to him. But 
in those days and times, that didn't take place. We don't even have an account of that taking place anywhere in the Bible. But uh, the law did say that. And in the days of Rome, they're the only ones that can carry out capital punishment. So that's really not an option. But Joseph had to be brokenhearted. He's in this conundrum. Mary's pregnant. He had trusted her. He felt betrayed. And he's angry, probably. He feels like he's made like a, been, been made into a fool. And if he, does, if he carries out the divorce, right? If he carries out the divorce, Mary and the child are going to be penniless. They're going to be outcast. But if he decides to marry her, his, his integrity is, going, is going, to be, uh, going to be destroyed. But Joseph is the unsung hero of the Christmas story. It says that he was a righteous man. He wasn't a legalist, but he was righteous. Joseph was a man who lived according to the law, but not for the law. Joseph was a man that many people looked up to. And I think Jesus looked up to Joseph as well. So when Joseph saw Mary, he didn't believe it. And we wouldn't have either. He considered what he must do. He considered this. The scriptures say, Joseph's between a rock and a hard place. If Joseph stays with Mary, his reputation is going to go to the tank. Uh, he, he, he's not going to be able to do work in that community because he's, he's a man of, of no integrity because he's, he's done this or he's allowed this to happen to him. His financial future is at stake. His admittance into the synagogue is not going to happen if he takes this bride, Mary, with baby into his life. He'll be forever labeled as weak by those who know him best. If he rejects Mary, she is going to be uh, living in poverty. He's going to be seen as a, as a despicable man by some because he's impregnated her and then he's abandoned her. That doesn't happen anymore. Uh, Joseph listened to, uh, not, not to, not to reason, but really to his heart. So what he decided to do is just quietly divorce her, distance himself from her, and move on with the rest of his life. As he considered this, can you imagine what Joseph was going through? As he considered this, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. The angel of the Lord comes to him in a dream. Mary gets a conversation. Joseph gets a dream, okay? But in this dream, the angel comes to him and says, Joseph, you know what your problem is? Fear. That's your problem, Joseph. I mean, this is a gut shot. This is a heart check for him. He doesn't, he doesn't think it's fear. He's just trying to work out what the best thing is, but it's really fear that, he's, that, that, that is distressing him so much. You know, fear will cause us to make terrible decisions in life. Listen, fear can be used to rationalize disobedience. Fear can be a convenient pretext for noncompliance to God's will. Here's what it sounds like. I'm too scared to speak up. So I'll just keep my mouth shut. I'll never do this again because I failed so miserably the first time. I don't want to get embarrassed in front of a bunch of people at church getting baptized. Oh, I've heard that one. Don't let fear cause you to rationalize disobedience. Some people say, you know, I can't start tithing because money's tight. Don't let fear get in the way of being obedient to God. Fear can be used for a convenient justification for inaction rather than taking the more challenging path of doing the right thing. I am a card-carrying member of the People Pleaser Association of the United States. I've been president sometime. So that's my wife. And there have been times that I have not done the right thing or said the right thing because I was afraid of what people might think. Can I get a witness or I'm the only joker in the room, right? I mean, not all of you struggle with that. Some of you need to struggle a little bit with that because you should just say everything that's on your mind. <laughs> yeah, there's some heads. I'm not going to call out names because we're online. But anyway, my point is, like, we can't allow... Our, the, our fear of what others think govern us making decisions and following God. We cannot be afraid of what people will think. But, you know, here's the thing. Obedience is not the easy path. It wasn't for Joseph. I mean, 
you know, disobedience isn't easy, but obedience isn't really any easier. We must say to ourselves, fear won't govern my decisions. You know, fearing what the world thinks will cause us to forfeit God's blessings and plans for us. Let me say that again. Fear of what others think will cause us to forfeit God's blessings for us. Now, as I've already said, Joseph's decision to obey God will cause him to receive the animosity of the world around him for the rest of his life. And so Joseph's going to be haunted by this pregnancy. And so will Mary and so will Jesus. It's going to impugn Joseph's business dealings. It, it, his, his integrity is always going to be suspect because of this pregnancy. It so will be for Mary. Mary and Joseph are not invited to the Christmas Eve party. No, they're not. Because that's just weird. Here's this woman at a wedding. You know, like we know the story, okay? But it also impugns uh, this pregnancy will, will overshadow Jesus' life. Do you remember that time? That Jesus is talking to some Jews that are opposed to him. And they say, we know who our father is, who is yours. See, this, this pregnancy will overshadow their lives the rest of their lives. Obedience is not any easier than disobedience. But it does come with God's blessing and reward. Now, we need to go back to Matthew one twenty because God supplies what Joseph needs for courage. Listen again. And he considered this as the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph's son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And these words to Joseph are the ingredients to stir up courage. To stir up courage. So it's not all up to us. God supplies the ingredients for courage. So the first ingredient Joseph has, he has a supernatural experience. He has a divine dream. And he knows this is like no other dream. This is a, a special dream, a divine dream. Secondly, the angel explains to Joseph that Mary has not been unfaithful, that she has been supernaturally overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. Now, he may hearken back to what I talked about last week about the Holy Spirit overshadowing creation and bringing order out of chaos. But at least he thinks about Abraham and Mary, the father of the Israel people, and they in their old age had a baby. So at least he has some context of God doing miraculous things unheard of, unseen in any other time of the world. And then thirdly, the angel reminds Joseph of his messianic lineage. See that? Joseph son of David. Do you see that? He's, the angel's reminding Joseph, you've been part of the messianic plan before you were born. God had a plan and a man, and you're part of this plan. And, and Messiah's going to come through your lineage. Mary's from the house of David. So, so this, this history, this genealogy, you know, ancestry.com, you know, okay, here it is. I'm part of it, right? And so, uh, uh, so, so, so Joseph has the ingredients. He's got to stir it up, but it's all there for him. Now, God's unfailing plan to redeem his people is going to happen. God supplies the ingredients for courage to do his will. Three things Joseph received. Supernatural experience, the history of God doing the impossible, and God's unfailing plan to redeem his people. And you know what? You've gotten the same ingredients too. When you walk into this room on Sunday, and the Holy Spirit has, has come into this place because we have gathered in the name of Jesus. If you're open to it, if you've been praying for it, if you've been preparing for it, God will stir your heart, and then he's stirring the hearts of everyone else. And when I come here on Sunday, my heart is stirred because, not only because of God's spirit, but because y'all's spirit, Ewan's spirit, right? East Tennessee. Ewan's and us's and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> it, we have a supernatural experience. Have you not had this experience where you've missed church for some reason? Some legitimate reason. I don't know what they are, but there's some legitimate reason you miss church, okay? <laughs> I'm just joking here. Hey, you can laugh. 
Don't be afraid. <clears throat> and you go, you say to yourself about Tuesday, man, I really miss church. I've had that. What's going on there? When we come together, God is encouraging and strengthening us. The second thing, God's history of doing the impossible. Yeah, he's done the impossible in the Bible, but he's done it right here amongst us. So Kim and Candy walked out of Satan's jaws of cancer, right? There have been people here who contemplated suicide who have not because the Holy Spirit had entered their life and believers entered their life to guide them out of that mess. There are marriages that were headed to divorce court. I mean, the papers were drawn up. But they're still together and they're thriving. They're flourishing as a couple because we've seen miraculous things happening right here. And then God's unfailing plan to redeem his people. <clears throat> I'm going to give you the best commentary on the whole Bible in two words. You ready for it? You might want to write it down. Here it is. Ready? Here it is. We win. We win. God's people win. I don't care what's happening in the world, what's happening in our life. I mean, I care. I mean, it's not that I don't care. Let me rephrase that. There are terrible things happening in the world, but we still win. We win. There's a new heaven. There's a new earth. One of the reasons that we get go sad mad is because we're not contemplating the present reality of the Holy Spirit living in us, making us victorious. We need to think about who we are, who we belong to, and that we have a promised future that outshines anything that we could come up with on our, on our own so if you're hesitating in trusting god or obeying god or serving if you're hesitating you're waiting to understand everything before you courageously step out on faith to do god's will anybody ever had that ever happen in their life you know if i just understand i had a friend tell me one time you know if i just if god would just meet me halfway and i said he walked to the cross. What else do you want him to do? Right? <laughs> Think about it. You don't, when you, when you walk into a room, most of you don't understand how electricity works. Now, there are a few in here that are scientists like Jim and others, and they could tell you how the electrons move and all that kind of stuff. But most of us don't. But we have faith that when we move the switch up, the lights come on, Right? We, we don't understand all kinds of things in life, but we still trust that they are going to work. And so we don't have to understand everything to know what God's will is in our life. Sometimes, for me, God's will has been overwhelmingly understood, and I knew exactly what to do. And other times, I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed, and you know what? God didn't say a word. And later on, I began to think about it. Well, I'm created in the image of God. I've got a Bible I, I've got people around me who are godly. I think God's looking at me and going, look, bro, I've given you all the tools to make a decision. Make a decision. Whatever you decide, I can work with it because my ability to work in your life is not based on your good decision making. <laughs> is anybody with me on that? You don't have to make a great decision to God to work through it. Look at the Bible. I mean, it's full of people who are knuckleheads and God still uses them. So recognize the Holy Spirit is working in your life. Trust and obey Him. Somebody might be having a Jesus moment this morning. I mean, a Joseph moment this morning. Well, they know God wants them to do something, but they've been on the fence. And I'm just telling you right now, obedience takes courage. Matthew 121, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. In the day that Jesus lived, names were significant. Jesus is the Greek form of the word Joshua, which means God saves. And God the Father gave Jesus the Son the name, the Lord saves. You know, in our times, in our day and times, baby names are chosen mostly because of popularity. So I looked it up, 2023, the most popular boy name, Liam. Obviously, they haven't seen his movies. And... <laughs> I heard something really funny. Liam Nielsen uh, being Santa Claus. <laughs> I know where you sleep. <laughs> I know what you've done. Yeah, I mean, Liam, really? The, se the second most, uh, uh, or no, the, the most popular girl's name, Olivia. And so, you know, Liam and Olivia are in. Edna and Elmer are out. Right? 
think about it. And, you know, Bob and Marie are good names, but you don't hear those much anymore. And it's just further evidence of the decline of our civilization, okay? <laughs> but the Jews to- chose names for more than just popular appeal, <clears throat> okay? So Moses, his name means drawn out of the water. Moses was drawn out of the Nile River. Sometimes names were chosen because of a parent's faith. Hannah, who was barren, didn't have a child, prayed earnestly for a child. Samuel was born, and Samuel's name means asked of God. She was asking God, making prayers to God for a child. God supplied it. The name John means God is gracious. Sometimes people were chose names in the Bible because of purpose. So Abram's name was changed to Abraham, which means father of nations. God chose Jesus' name because he has a desire to save the world. Listen to me. If you don't understand this or believe this, God has not come here to destroy this world. God has entered our atmosphere. He's entered into our lives to save us. By obeying him, he is saving you. He wants to spare us from the consequences of sin. He wants to redeem us from the, from, from the fall of man. He wants to have a relationship with us. In the Garden of Eden, God wants you to be his family. And so Joseph, he was obedient. He didn't choose the name. Well, that's a big deal. I mean, even to today, like choosing the name is a big deal, right? If, when you have a child, like who's going to choose the name? It's a big deal. But in that day, it was even a bigger deal because the father is naming his child. Joseph doesn't get that privilege That's ta- that God does that. But you know what Joseph does do? He remains the provider, the protector, and the mentor for Jesus as he grew up. So my, my thinking is when Jesus began talking about the Father in heaven, it wasn't very hard for him because he had an earthly stepfather who did the right thing. You know, I was just encouraging Andy today as we saw Kylie's baptism. And, and I, was just, I was just trying to encourage him, like, this is, dads, lead your family to Christ. It's the biggest blessing you'll ever be, give to them, and it's the biggest blessing your family will ever receive. So, <clears throat> obedience to God builds courage. Courage could be, or could be defined as grace under the pressure of obedience. Courage is not limited to battle, uh, battlefield bravery, but it's not limited to when someone enters your house, a thief, and you stand up and, you know, you, you protect. It. Real tests of courage are much deeper, much quieter. They are the inner tests, like remaining faithful when nobody's looking, offering grace when you're maligned in your integrity, or like Joseph, choosing to be a faithful and husband even when it seems impossible and what you're going through. When Joseph woke, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born. And Joseph named him Jesus. Joseph's courage grew out of his obedience to God's plan. But there's this, there's this tension in Joseph's head. To do the right thing. And I want to lean into that tension just for a moment by giving you a reading from Max Licato. And, th- and when I read this to you, it's Joseph's thoughts on the night that Jesus was born. This isn't the way I planned it, God. Not at all. My child being born in a stable, this isn't the way I thought it would be. A cave with sheep and donkeys, hay and straw. My wife giving birth with only the stars to hear her pain. This isn't what I imagined. No, I imagined family. I imagined grandmothers. I imagined neighbors clustered outside the door with friends standing at my side. I imagined the house erupting with the first cry of the infant. Slaps on the back, loud laughter, jubilation. That's how I thought it would be. But now, who will celebrate with us? The sheep? Shepherds, stars, that doesn't seem right. What kind of husband am I? I provide no midwife to aid my wife, no bed to rest her back. 
Her pillow is a blanket from a donkey. Did I miss something here, God? When you sent the angel and spoke of the son being born, this isn't what I pictured. I envisioned Jerusalem, the temple, the priest, the people gathered to watch a pageant, perhaps, a parade. I mean, this is the Messiah. Forgive me for asking, but is this how God enters the world? I'm unaccustomed to such strangeness, God. I'm a carpenter. I make things fit. I square off the edges. I follow the plumb line. I measure twice before I cut. Surprises are not the friend of a builder. I like to know the plan before I begin, but this time, I'm not the builder, am I? Can't you, can't you just picture Joseph's conundrum and all of that? He's being obedient, but life's not making sense. Have, has that ever happened to you? You're being obedient, but... It still seems like things are swirling downward. Several years after Jesus was born, he'll meet some wise men. Let, let me explain that again so you can go home and adjust your live nativity. Several years after Jesus was born, living in a house about two years old, the wise men come from the Far East. Took them a while to get there. Trains were slow that day, I don't know. Anyway. He has another dream. After the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up! Flee to Egypt with the child and the mother, the angel said. Stay there until I tell you to return, because Herod is going to search for the child and kill him. That night, Joseph left for Egypt with the child and Mary, his mother. Joseph has the second dream. He hears what the angel tells him, and he does exactly what the angel tells him immediately. Had he not done that, his family would have been slaughtered in Bethlehem. He gets up and he goes. Joseph's obedience increased, and so did his courage and confidence with the Lord increased with it. When Herod died, the angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. So third dream. Now they're in Egypt, and he says, get up and go home. Now, where they go is Nazareth. Now, wait a minute. That's where this story started out. Nazareth. He's going back to the very people who see them as suspect. He's going back to the very people who had those rumors and things talking about him. He goes right back there in it. Because you know what? Joseph is walking with the Lord. He's not walking in fear. And so, you and I haven't had a miraculous dream. Like, well, I haven't. Maybe you have. But we haven't had that kind of a dream. But we have been given a revelation of God's entire story that we win, and we call that the Bible, and we know the outcome, even when the middle chapters are muddy and foggy. We see so many examples, so many promises of God, of people following God courageously. If God is with us, say it with me, who can stand against us? We win, folks. All this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message to the prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child and she will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means, say with me, God is with us. He's with us. The primary reason that Christians doubt and fear is because they don't know this present reality that God is with us. And so... Our future outcome is secured by this present reality. God is with us. If you have not made room in your heart to receive Christ, today is the day. You've already witnessed one young lady who decided today is the day. I want to be baptized the day Jesus was born so I never forget it. I think that's just awesome. Today could be your day. We have a supersonic sin filter on our baptistry. Look, I'm not joking. If God, if God is pushing, if you know I need to do something to get right with God, today is the day. But it takes courage, doesn't it? It takes courage to come to God. So many times, I, Christians, I'm not talking about non-Christians, I'm talking about people who've gone to church, but then they've gone back in the darkness. People like me, people who grew up in Christ, but then walked straight back into the darkness. 
And sometimes we wonder, as I wondered, will God accept me back? Let me tell you something. Our God is a gracious God. And he tells a bunch of stories. My favorite, the prodigal, of a son who walked away from the father, but returned back to the father, and the father welcomed him back. It takes courage to come to God. Listen, I've given you the ingredients of courage. You just got to stir it up and come to him. Today's the day of salvation. Let's stand and worship. I'll be right down here if you want to talk about your decision to follow God.